Hi, this is Mike Hendrickson from Software Architecture in New York. I'm here with Duncan DeVore. Duncan, how are you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. So you're with Lightbend. And yes. We, we had a conversation in Europe oh, six months ago or so. Yep. Can you catch me up on what you guys have been up to since that time? Yeah, our conversation um, in London was about um, reactive architectures and, and what that means to us as a company. And that's still one of the, the primary cores of, of what we do. Um, another thing that I wanted to mention that uh, I don't, I'm not sure I mentioned while I was in London, one of the core tenets of, of our company is, um, it sounds uh, kind of simple, but it's, it's pretty complex, is the idea of we, we like to build things that work, right? And so one of the uh, things for ACA, for example, I always wanted a byline for it to be, it just works. Um, I've used ACA for a long time. And, um, but at the same time, we're also pragmatists in the sense that um, we're not going to reinvent the wheel on everything where it doesn't need to be reinvented. And um, I think one of the things that has come from the notion of being reactive um, in the background has been this whole idea of, of uh, you know, processing of data, big data. Um, back in the 90s, you know, with OLAP cubes and all these kinds of things, all kinds of data and such, they were being processed in a batch mode. Um, but now that's no longer the case, right? It's, it's streaming, right? It's streaming, exactly. And, and um, I think one of the neat examples, uh, or kind of like an analogy, is you can imagine if, say, for example, Google uh, were to batch their data uh, and update their index every hour, but um, say Yahoo or Bing were to uh, stream it in, that would put uh, Google at a competitive disadvantage um, or significant disadvantage. So the idea is streaming of data and processing that in real term, or real time. There's where I think the complexity begins to arrive, right? And it, becomes the, it begins to become difficult. And the problem is, is that the volume of data that is coming in is staggering. It's enormous. So there's a lot of different things that one has to do to, to deal with that. Um, they have to be able to filter out the noise. You can think about when you're walking down the street and you're uh, going to a particular location. There's so much input, right? Cars, people, signs, weather, all this stuff. Um, but you need to focus. So you're actually, your brain is filtering out a tremendous amount of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And the same is true for, for fast data. And that's a process of learning and how to do that. The other thing that your brain is doing is... And fast being streaming? Data? Streaming, yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm going to yeah. use uh, yeah. the, the term interchangeably here. Okay. The other thing is... Um, your brain is uh, also auto-correcting. So as you go down the street and perhaps um, uh, you, don't, you didn't cap, catch the sign change to don't walk, right, and a car takes off, you stop, right, and adjust for that. So there's so many things going on, and each one of those things is a little data point that has arrived and you've processed. Um, <clears throat> the human brain is far more complex than even the best of computers. So. But the ideas behind uh, what we're trying to do have, have been around for a long time in AI. And um, essentially what it boils down to is, is kind of something that has been around for 50 plus years, and that's the notion of something called a feedback loop and control. So in other words, you're receiving data in, you're processing that data. Making decisions. You're making dis you know, small decisions, and uh, you're kind of building in, in kind of like a cluster of uh, things that are making decisions. And do we learn from those decisions so that we kind of self-heal and react well, exactly. appropriately so, in the future? So that takes us to the next notion is um, exactly, we have to learn. So there, there are statistical regression and, and linear and non-linear algebraic you know, equations that are already out there, optimization routines and stuff like that. And, and those um, can be tuned, right? Just like you would tune a car, car engine. Uh, depending on the type of race it's it's going to be in, and um, over time you can you can historically tune those to give you better results. It's like your thermostat in your house, right? It's going to learn over time, especially in a smart house, yeah. um, how to keep the temperature because perhaps your insulation isn't the best or it's or better. Timing during the day. Timing yeah. during the day, yeah. exactly, yeah. to save money, yeah. uh, exactly. And so um, the streaming of data, fast data. Um, brings in or brings to the forefront a new way to process that data in really what is called near real time, um, sub second, and then making decisions and then adjusting uh, on the fly. Now, the problem becomes is that, again, as I had mentioned, the volume of data that you're capturing and processing is, is 
beyond the capabilities of, of processing, you know, of AI. So one of the things that's required is every particular use case for that data, you have to determine what we would call an acceptable delta of error. So if I'm going to operate within the confines of an error, say between 5% and 8% or 10%, as long as I can keep my error rate within that, then I'm good. Errors are going to happen. There's nothing you can do about it. It's impossible to, you know, to create the perfect system. Where our architecture comes in is the notion behind streaming requires uh, real-time processing. And in any real-time processing situation or near real-time processing situation, you have to have elasticity, right, and all the components of the reactive uh, manifesto in order to stay up and running. Um, real time doesn't work real well if pieces are failing. And this is real time in the cloud? In the cloud, exactly. Yes. Yeah, it's real not time. On a hardware device or anything. Right. It, I mean, it could be local cloud, it could be hybrid. you know hybrid cloud, it could be full on out cloud. Um, but the idea is, you know, it, the same applies to security and, and everything. You have to be able to process that data as it's arriving, as opposed to get a bunch of data, sit down, do the research, figure out what the answer is, and then respond. And how does someone get going? I notice you, we have a book here. Is that yeah. from Dean, right? Yeah, from Dean, yeah. Dean Wampler is our, our fast data expert, and, and he, he has a book called Fast Data Architectures for Streaming Applications. Is that a good get start with? Yeah, it's a great book to kind of under, understand the problem mm -hmm. and explain it. And we also have a, uh, a nice little card which kind of walks through some of the different components that could be part of a fast data system. Um, and, and how you're going to uh, build your system. I think one of the other things that's interesting, um, I had the pleasure of working on a system in the 90s, which was essentially um, kind of somewhere between batch and fast data. And um, there's also a, uh, a social aspect of this that um, one has to grapple with. Um, in our particular situation, it was for a financial company, and it was to basically take a look at their investment um, strategies and run them through a LISP, uh, artificial intelligence engine and take a look at all the possibilities of where the company could invest. The one thing that caught us completely off guard is as we, when we went to sell it, um, there was pushback because the folks uh, that handled the money, they were concerned that this thing would replace them. And so as you get into... It could have been 20 years or 30 yeah, years. Yeah, yeah. So as yeah. you get into these kinds of concepts, that's, yeah. there's these social impacts that you also have to consider too. Um, and the idea was, is no, it's not meant to replace you, it's meant to augment you. So self-healing sounds like that. Like, you know, why are we going to need developers if we have software we build that self-heals? Exactly. And self-adjusts and self-maintains. So is that not the same thing? I mean, are we going to get to a point to where a piece of software is totally self-healing and autonomous? So that's a great question. I mean, that's the infamous AI. I mean, I just read an article on Elon Musk who's very concerned about um, where AI is going. Uh, I, I think that in the future, down the road, is a possibility, but I still think we're, we're far away from it. I, I believe, my, my personal opinion is that we're at least 10 years. And what are the least. impediments to get there quicker? Just right. processing power, um, being able to... Um, Orchestrate machines working together? Yeah, so like you can look at a problem. If, if you're an optimization engineer, you can look at a problem. You can make the decision of what is noise and what isn't noise. Uh, computers, you know, they're still having difficulties doing that. There's so many things that the human brain can do that computers can't do yet, and it's still a long ways off. Yeah, we may have one computer that can play chess really well, but it can't drive a car at the same time and, and do all these different things. It's, it's very linear focused. And so th the idea of fast data, one of the challenges behind fast data is the tuning of it. Um, an e-commerce solution has a significantly different potentially delta of error than say perhaps an uh, energy company would have. Uh, two totally different um, genres of business and you can't just generically apply a solution to it. Right, there's, there's a lot of complexities there that have to be considered. And, and self-healing is different than like self-architecting? Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, self absolutely, yeah, like sure. Having that thought process to do that? That's, to that's an excellent point, yeah. And the other thing too is self-healing is, is uh, basically keeping the system running as opposed to designing a system right. that would keep itself running. Architecting. Right? I think you're always going to need a designer outside of, of uh, until computers become self-aware. <laughs> And we have Skynet. You know, you're always going to need a, a designer. Um, it's just they're just not there yet. So, 
Duncan, if you look forward and we have this discussion in London in six months, what would you like to say changes for you folks at LightBest? And what would you like to see change in the industry in general? So I think um, what changes us or changes for us on LightBend is the fact that, that our fast data platform um, will be becoming more mature. Um, our alpha release will have been out and so forth. And, and, and folks, when's that coming? Um, timing wise, I believe it's next, the beginning of next quarter. I'd okay. have to double check. I don't remember off the top of my head. Okay. Um, but um, so I think that will be out there, and that will begin to get some traction. I think the exciting thing is the technologies that it's built upon are, are battle-tested in the field. I mean, it, there's tons of stuff, uh, uh, Spark and, and all these different uh, parts, Elastic Search and so forth. But, so I think that's exciting to begin to get some of that feedback um, and begin to learn how to tune that system, get to know the system. You know, it's very much like anything, a car or whatever. You have to get learn to know it a little bit. It's got its own personality. And then to be able to craft that for the individual customer. That's where the, how, how are we going to abstract a, a, a generic uh, protocol that, that it makes it easier for the customer to be able to um, utilize the features that Fast Data provides. A generic extraction, but a custom to that particular... Yeah, kind story. of think think of it kind of like a domain specific language. How I can set up some anomaly detection rules or whatever for my specific yeah. use case, etc. Excellent, Duncan. So, we look forward to that conversation. Thank, thank you. you. Look forward to it.